and welcome to this knowledge clip on one of the most famous cases that the ICJ has handed down, the case concerning military and paramilitary activities in and against Nicaragua. This case was brought by Nicaragua against the U.S. before the ICJ in 1984 for activities that the U.S. conducted in Central America in the period from 1981 to 1984. The substantive legal issues arising from this case, such as attribution or the use of force, are addressed in two other knowledge clips. In this knowledge clip, what I would like to do is to focus on the jurisdictional aspect of the case, which the court addressed in its judgment on jurisdiction and admissibility in 1984. Now, as you will remember from your lecture, the ICJ, as with any other international courts and tribunals, has jurisdiction to hear a dispute if and only if the states consent to the jurisdiction of the court. The means by which uh, states consent to the jurisdiction of the ICJ are found under uh, Article 36 of the ICJ statute. In the Nicaragua case, two of these bases were invoked, but for the purposes of the knowledge clip today, we will only focus on the optional clause declarations issued under Article 36, Paragraph 2 of the ICJ statute. The wording of Article 36, Paragraph 2, you can see on the slide now. Now, in this case, uh, both Nicaragua and the U.S. had issued uh, optional clause declarations accepting the jurisdiction of the ICJ, but there were uh, problems uh, arising from each of these declarations. For Nicaragua, it issued a uh, declaration in 1929 accepting the jurisdiction of not the ICJ, but the Permanent Court of International Justice, the PCIJ, which was the predecessor of the ICJ. As you can see from the wording of Nicaragua's declaration, it accepted the jurisdiction of the PCIJ unconditionally without any reservation. But the question is, of course, can a declaration accepting the jurisdiction of the PCIJ be considered also as a, uh, an acceptance of the jurisdiction of the ICJ? Well, Article 36, Paragraph 5 of the ICJ statute addresses this situation. And as you can see from the wording of Article 36, Paragraph 5, the key words here are declarations which are still in force. Now, what happened in this case was that Nic Nicaragua had signed the protocol to the statute of the PCIJ, indicating its consent to become a party to the statute. The authorities of Nicaragua had also ratified the protocol, but the instrument of ratification was never sent to nor received by the Secretariat of the League of Nations. So based on this, the U.S. argued that because Nicaragua had not ratified the uh, protocol to the statute, it had not become a party to the statute, and therefore the 1929 dec declaration was not a declaration in force within the meaning of Article 36, Paragraph 5. Now, in response, the court held that under the PCIJ system, a declaration was valid when it was made by the state when either signing or ratifying the statute to the protocol. Nicaragua had signed the protocol, therefore the declaration was valid. But because Nicaragua had not ratified the protocol, the declaration did not have binding force. But the court further examined the French and the English texts of Article 36, Paragraph 5. It also examined the intention of the drafters behind Article 36, 5, which it established to be a desire to maintain the continuity between the two courts. And it examined the conduct of the UN as well as other states in respect of Nicaragua's declaration. All of this led the court to conclude that Nicaragua's declaration was one that was enforced within the meaning of Article 36.5, and therefore Nicaragua had accepted the jurisdiction of the ICJ. Now, with regards to the U.S., the U.S. issued a declaration accepting the jurisdiction of the ICJ in 1946. However, the U.S. Uh, declaration was subject to several conditions which could be categorized into two main groups, the temporal condition and the substantive condition. There were two temporal conditions. The first one was found in the 1946 declaration itself. And by this, Nicaragua, um, uh, excuse me, the U.S. stated that it uh, agreed 
uh, for this declaration to be terminated, but only after six months from the date that a notice of termination was issued. The second uh, temporal condition is was found in a notification that the U.S. Uh, deposited in 1984. With this 1984 notification, the U.S. purported to exclude disputes uh, in relating to or arising out of Central America, and the notification was to take effect immediately. Now, what is interesting is that the U.S made this uh, notification on the 6th of April, 1984, just three days before Nicaragua initiated the case before the court on the 9th of April, 1984. So if this notification was indeed to have effect immediately, then the court would not have jurisdiction. The substantive um, condition to uh, the U.S. declaration uh, was uh, found in a reservation to the declaration in which the U.S. excluded disputes arising from a multilateral treaty unless the parties to the treaty are also parties to the case before the court. Now we will look at these in turn. Regarding the temporal condition, the U.S. argued that it had committed by virtue of its 1946 declaration um, to terminate the declaration only on six months notice. In contrast, uh, Nicaragua's 1929 declaration was indefinite in duration, and therefore it was subject to immediate termination without the need for prior notification. On this basis, the U.S. argued that Nicaragua and the U.S. had not accepted the same obligation as required under Article 36, Paragraph 2 of the ICJ statute. What did the court say? Well, the court said first, um, Optional clause declarations under Article 36, Paragraph 2 were unilateral declarations that states were free to make as well as free to attach conditions or reservations. But these unilateral declarations established a series of bilateral commitments with other states uh, making optional clause declaration accepting the same obligation. So in this case, the U.S. had already committed itself in the 1946 declaration to terminate the uh, declaration only on six months notice. Therefore, it had made a solemn and formal commitment not to terminate this declaration before the six months notice has passed. With regards to the uh, reciprocity argument, the, US, uh, um, the court dismissed this uh, argument by the U.S. The court said that um, the requirement or the notion of reciprocity was only concerned with the scope and the substance of the commitment. It did not concern the formal conditions on which the commitment was created, its duration or its extinction. And therefore, in this case, the U.S. made a commitment to terminate the uh, declaration on six months notice, but Nicaragua never made any such commitment. So uh, the U.S. could not invoke reciprocity against Nicaragua in this case. And finally, the court said that for um, declarations which are of uh, indefinite duration, duration, such as that of Nicaragua, these declarations should be treated uh, in accordance with the law of treaties, which requires a reasonable time for withdrawal from or termination of treaties, which do not contain any provision on the duration of validity. In the court's view, uh, the duration of three days from the 6th of April to the 9th of April was not reasonable. And so on, uh, on all these grounds, the court came to the conclusion that the 1984 notification uh, on the part of the U.S. could not override its obligations to submit to the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. And finally, with regard to the multilateral treaty reservation, indeed, the court found that El Salvador, which was a party to the UN Charter, as well as the Charter of the Organization of American States, was a party uh, that could be affected by the decision of the uh, court in relation to these two charters. And therefore, the US reservation had effect, and the court was excluded, or the court did not have jurisdiction over any disputes arising from these two uh, instruments. So thank you very much for your attention.